Dr. Zakir Naik. I may ask Dr. Muhammad Naik to proceed to the stage to control the questions, please. Jazakallah. May God reward you for your rapt attention and keen interest for the talk of the day. Now we would have the presumably more interesting session, a dialogue, an interaction, a cross-checking of the speaker for what he says, the question and answer session. To derive more benefit in the limited time that we have available with us today, we would kindly request you to observe the following rules. Your question to the speaker should be on the topic itself, similarities between Islam and Christianity. Your question should be brief and to the point, preferably in one or two short sentences. You may ask only one question at a time. For your second question, you are requested to kindly go at the back of the queue and await your turn. The organizers have four microphones arranged in the hall for your questions. One on my right, that is to your left in the front for the ladies, and the other three microphones are for the gents on my left and in the two center aisles. You are kindly requested to queue up at the microphone for the open question and answer session if you wish to ask a question to the speaker. The first preference for questions would be offered to our esteemed guests who are non-Muslims so that we give more opportunities to pressing doubts as we have a scholar of comparative religion before us today. May I request volunteers to kindly see that the questioners speak into the mic, preferably four to five inches away from the mic so that all can hear the question clearly and lastly, may I request you to kindly state your name and profession so that the speaker may answer you in a more befitting manner. Yes, are the questioners ready at their mics? Dr. Zakir would be at this microphone. I would conduct the proceedings as the coordinator and host of the session from the seat on the left. And as I take my seat and the questioners get ready, may I take this opportunity to thank the Dubai International Holy Quran Award and its committee, and especially the activities in charge, Brother Arif Julfar, for their tremendous efforts in having such a wonderful program going on before us. May we have the first question as I leave the floor open for you to ask the questions to Dr. Zakir and he to respond to you. May I request the non-Muslims to be given the first preference and may we start with the ladies first on the microphone. Then we go in clockwise performance. The second question on that mic, third in the center aisle here, fourth here and so on in a circular manner. And as a secondary preference after the questions on the mics, are over, we would give opportunity for the questions on slips. But of course, the bold and the courageous have to be given a preference first, and then would be the question of the slips to the people who would prefer not to come on mic. Any questions from the ladies? Preferably a non-Muslim? Yes. Uh, may you state your name and profession before Dr. Zakir? My name is Salha. I'm a singer. Just wondering about the difference in uh, Islam and Christianity about uh, death and resurrection of Jesus, peace be upon him. The sister asked the question, what is the difference in Islam and Christianity regarding the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him? As I did mention a little bit in my speech, that in Islam, the Quran mentions in Surah Nisa, 
chapter number 4 verse number 158 that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala almighty God raised Jesus Christ peace be upon him alive so we believe that Jesus Christ peace be upon him he did not die he was raised up alive the same thing if you read in the Bible I've given a talk and had a debate that was Christ really crucified and we believe that Jesus Christ peace be upon him he was not crucified even from the Bible I can prove that but that requires time so what we believe that even the Bible does not mention that Jesus Christ peace be upon him died on the cross but there's a difference in the reading of the common Christians. They said that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was crucified. For that you can see my debate, was Christ really crucified? As far as the second coming is concerned, we Muslims believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, will come again on the face of the earth, which is also believed by the Christians. We believe he's going to come again. The reason we believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, has been raised up alive is because he is the only messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, whose followers as a whole mistook that he claimed divinity. He's the only messenger. So because his followers as a whole, they had a misunderstanding that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, claimed divinity. That's the reason Almighty God has raised him up alive. And in his second coming, it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse 116. He will say, and he will tell Almighty God, you be my witness. I never told them to worship me, but I said, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi or Rabbakum, who's my Lord and your Lord. And similarly, it's mentioned, if you read the gospel, it's mentioned in the gospel, in his second coming, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, many people will say, Oh Lord, did we not do wonders and miracles in your name? So Jesus Christ will say, E men of iniquity, E sinful people, you depart from here, I don't even know you. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, in his second coming, he will come to testify that he never claimed divinity, but he was the messenger of Almighty God. Hope that answers the question. We request the non-Muslims, this is the opportunity you can ask any question. Please feel free to ask any question. Even if it's a criticism, I can take it, I'm young. I'm young, I can take it. Even if it's any question against Islam, any doubt that you have, this is the opportunity. Please feel free. You will rarely get such opportunity. You're most welcome to ask any questions for the non-Muslim, even if the question is outside the topic I'll entertain. So if you have any questions regarding the topic similarities between Islam and Christianity, or any other question on Islam, this is your opportunity. Please feel free. You're most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and compiled religion. Yes, brother, your name and your profession. My name is Jack Elphinstone, and I'm an engineer. In your talk earlier, you mentioned that one of the reasons you should visit Mecca in your life is because that was the first place that Allah was worshipped. But we know that Allah was worshipped long before where in Adam, Noah, and Moses, and many prophets uh, worshipped Allah. But that wasn't in Mecca. So explain for me, clarify, was... Mecca the first place that Allah was worshipped or before? The brother asked a very good question that it's mentioned in the Bible and also mentioned in the Quran. The Bible says, blessed are those people who visit the valley of Bakka, that's Mecca. And the Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 96, that the first place of worship was Mecca. The brother asked the question that there were many prophets who came before Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You know, Moses, Jesus, Abraham, Adam, peace be upon them. So how can Mecca be the first place? Brother Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was not the first messenger. He was the last and final messenger. And Mecca was there much before. It was not the sacred place after Prophet Muhammad was born, peace be upon him. It was earlier. Mecca was the sacred place of worship much before. It's mentioned in the Quran that Abraham, peace be upon him, he rebuilt along with his son, Ishmael. They rebuilt the Kaaba. And the Hadith mentioned it was even there at the time of Adam, peace be upon him. So it's coming right down the ages. So it was there right before. Therefore the Quran says, the first place of worship is Makkah. And later on, when the Qibla was towards Masjid Aqsa, then later on it was brought to Makkah. But the first earlier place of worship was Makkah. Then it came back to Makkah. Hope that answers the question then. Any non-Muslim like to ask a question, they're most welcome to come up to the microphones. Yes, brother. Um, my name is Rahul Bhatia. I'm an engineer by profession. I have a question that has been in my mind for quite a while now. 
the noble quran says let there be no compulsion in religion that's point number 1 and point number 2 is that the punishment for a muslim who wants to come out of islam god forbid is death punishment according to me this signifies a virtual compulsion in the mind that this is the punishment which will be given to me so hence i cannot do it and this kind of uh, i just need some clarification i'm i'm sure there is a clarification on this point so that's a very good question he hasn't given the reference first he quoted the verse of the quran from surah bakara chapter number 2 verse number 256 which says laika hafid din there is no compulsion in religion and that is part of the din that you cannot force anyone you cannot compel anyone with the point of the sword or the point of the gun his next question is that if any muslim leaves his religion and becomes a non muslim becomes an apostate then the penalty is death so isn't this a sort of compulsion before i give the answer i have to mention that every country has its own law its rules and regulation and most of the countries one of the highest punishments is for treason for example if a person is working in the army and if he leaks the important thing of the country all the vital points and the information to the enemy it is called as treason most of the countries if anyone does treason sells the important blueprints and documents of the country to the enemy many of the countries the death penalty many of the country have life imprisonment so now if i tell that what kind of a country is this in where i am compelled by the country not to do certain things what is wrong is wrong so here also if a muslim becomes a non muslim it's only in the islamic state of law if that muslim who becomes a murtad and then propagates his new faith and deceives the people that's the time this penalty is put for example if in a school if i appoint a teacher mathematics teacher she is teaching 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 then tomorrow she teaches 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 so but naturally i won't keep her in my school the same way the punishment for such a murtad in islamic state it is death this will not be called as compulsion it will be a person who has strayed away from the truth to the falsehood but as far as making anyone accept islam no muslim can force any non muslim to accept islam at the point of the sword or at the point of the gun what we have to do is we have to convey the message if you like it you accept it if you don't like it no problem our job is to convey the message it's mentioned in the quran surah jashia chapter number 88 fazakir namma anta muzakkir our job is to deliver the message we have to deliver the message in the best way with hikma and with husna with most beautiful preaching whether the other human being non muslim accept or not it is not under our control we cannot force anyone to accept islam at the point of the sword the point of the gun but that what you are talking is a different case in a state of islamic law like as i give example where a person working in army if he sells the secret of the country then the penalty is somewhat similar hope that answers the question brother right okay yeah and may I again remind our audience the non muslims would be given first preference so much so that even if they have questions out of the topic but very relevant to the comparative religion scholarship of dr zakir and relevant for the needs of the time we would permit those questions too from non muslim yes sister um my name is caroline i'm a journalist I've got a two-part question here. Um does Islam propagate acts of forgiveness? Yes or no? Does Islam propagate acts of forgiveness? This was the question does Islam propagate acts of forgiveness? Of course yes. And every chapter, every surah of the glorious Quran begins with the formula Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. So why does it Yes sister the second part of the question And the second part of the question is why does it yes, permit no why does Islam permit honor killings Honor killing Yes What do you mean by honor killing sister? Honor killing the right to avenge your brother's blood in the name of Allah It might be out of context but I just need to know if this there's an the answer to this If I get you mean honor killing means if someone kills any human being to take revenge Yes That's what you mean Yes because I've read a few books and a lot of the times 
people have said that they are allowed to kill their brother or to kill somebody else because their brother has been killed by another human being. This was a sort of good question that if Islam propagates act of forgiveness, why does it permit honor killing? Yes. Why does it permit? That's a very good question. Sister, if you analyze this mission in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 178, the hat penalty, the punishment of death, on the basis of kisas. And Allah also says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, if anyone kills any other human being, whether it be Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. So as a general rule, if any human being kills any other human being, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity, except under two circumstances, unless it is for murder or for creating mischief in the land. Now, there are two exceptions where Islam gives permission where you can kill any other human being. Number one is, if that person has committed murder, which comes in your scope of question, honor killing. Number two is if he is creating facade, corruption in this land. Again, this is not compulsory. If someone kills someone, it's not compulsory, he has to be killed. Islam also says that if the relatives of the person who has been killed, if they take blood money, if they forgive the killer, that person who has killed can be forgiven. But under normal circumstances, if suppose, if he's killed someone and if I want death on that, because for death, again, the punishment is death. Like as it's mentioned earlier in the early scriptures, even in the Bible, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, it keeps on continuing. Here what we realize that suppose I know of a human being who's killing other people, innocent human being. If I don't kill him, he will keep on killing other human beings. So that law is not only in Islam, it's the law of most of the countries that if homicide is done, if someone has murdered someone in many countries, he should be put to death or there's life imprisonment. Even in Islam, that if he's killed someone, if required, he can be killed. But the relatives of the person even can forgive the person if they want. If they want, they can forgive the murderer. But if they want that he should be put to death, then he'll be put to death. And the second case where a person can be killed is if he's causing corruption in the land. For example, if someone is committing rape, now rape is nothing but causing corruption in the land. So in this case, that person should be put to death. Because the sin is so heinous. It is such a big crime that there is no other punishment but death penalty. And I have asked this to many non-Muslims. That God forbid, if someone rapes your mother, and if you are made the judge, and if the rapist is born in front of you, what punishment will you give him? And 100% of the non-Muslims, they told me that we will put him to death. Some went to the extreme of saying we will torture him to death. So why the double standards? You know in America, which happens to be one of the most advanced countries in the world, according to the FBI statistics, in 1990, every day on average, 1,753 cases of rape took place. According to 1996 statistics, US Department of Justice, every day 2,713 cases of rape took place. 1990, 1,756. 1996, 2,713. Maybe the Americans got more bold. That means every 32 seconds, one rape is taking place in America. We are here in this auditorium for the past about three hours. Already more than 300 rapes may have taken place in America. <laughs> so Islam has a system of hijab, which I mentioned in my talk. That when a man looks at a woman, he should lower the gaze. The woman should follow the Islamic hijab, which I mentioned earlier. After that, if any man commits rape, he gets capital punishment. Even the American law says that seven years rigorous imprisonment for a rapist, but most of the time he's let free. So when you ask even a non-Muslim what punishment will you give, 100% said we'll put him to death. There was one American who was a smart aleck. In America, he told me, Brother Zakir, first I will give him five years rigorous imprisonment. I told him, do you know, according to the status of America, out of those that commit rape, after the imprisonment and after they let free, more than 95% commit rape again. So if you want your daughter and your mother to be raped again, you're most welcome. I don't want that. So he said, if that is the case, in the first time, it's a problem to death. So in such cases, where there's corruption of land like rape, etc., Islam gives permission, death penalty can even be given for that case. Hope that answers the question, sister. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, sir. My yeah. name is uh, Any... Praveen Kumar, and I'm a computer programmer by profession. First of all, I would like to thank you for delivering such a wonderful lecture. And my question is, uh, from your presentation, it's very crystal clear that whatever 
the righteous path set in the islam it's also set in the christianity so why not a muslim or a christian take up both and take the good deeds in both the things and follow it the brother asked a very good question and a very important question and a chance to clarify my talk also asked a very good question that if everything is good i have talked about similarity in islam and christian everything is good so why don't we take the good of the religion that's what i've done i have taken the good of christianity that is the bible i can give a talk a longer talk differences in islam and christianity which i don't intend doing there are many things which i don't agree with the bible many things because i don't consider the bible as a whole to be the word of god we believe in the injil which was revealed to jesus christ peace be upon him but the present bible is a corrupted form of the original revelation which was given to jesus christ peace be upon him this bible if we analyze has got hundreds of contradictions has got hundreds of mathematical errors has got many scientific errors i had a debate with dr william campbell quran and the bible in light of science and i pointed out many scientific errors these scientific errors these contradictions cannot be attributed to almighty god there is even pornography in this bible which if you ask me to read even if you pay me a million dollar i can't read in front of the public pornography ezekiel chapter number 23 and i can quote the references but i cannot read it i cannot islam doesn't give me permission so what i have done brother i have followed the guidance of the quran of surah al imran chapter 3 verse 64 which says ta'ala ila kalmatin sawa in bainana bainakum come to come in terms as been assigned you at least what is common we agree to follow what is not common we will discuss it later on see when we have a interfaith dialogue i disagree with the way interfaith dialogue takes place in different parts of the world there is a christian who comes and says all religion are good islam is good christianity is good hinduism is good then a hindu comes and says islam is good christianity is good hinduism is good then a muslim comes and says islam is good christianity is good hinduism is good then when i ask the question will that christian priest give up christianity and accept islam if both are the same the answer is no will the hindu give up his religion and become a christian the answer is no will the muslim give his religion and become a hindu the answer is no it is nothing but hogwash what i have done i asked the people at least let us agree that one scripture in the world is 100% the word of god no one will have problem in that the hindu will say okay i don't mind accepting my scripture the veda to be the word of god 100% correct the christian will say i have got no problem i wouldn't mind accepting bible to be the word of god the muslim will say i have got no problem i wouldn't mind accepting quran to be the word of god now take out the common factors in all these major world religious scriptures at least agree to follow what is common all the major world religions they say there's one god they say idol worship is wrong all the major world religious scriptures say that the last and final messenger to come is prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam So when we analyze, I say, let us at least agree to follow what is common. All the major religions speak about modesty, even Hinduism. And earlier, when I had come to Dubai last year, I gave a talk on similarities between Hinduism and Islam. Even Hinduism says there is one God. I love worship prohibited. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is going to come. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is mentioned more than hundred places in the Hindu scripture. Even Hindu scripture says that you should be modest. The woman should be completely covered. The hair should be covered. Polygamy is allowed. in hinduism in christianity as well as in islam about modesty not to have alcohol not to gamble that doesn't mean everything of hinduism is correct similarly everything what today the christians follow is not correct what i have done i have used the furqan quran is the furqan the criteria to judge right from wrong what is matching with the quran i have got no objection in accepting that to be correct what contradicts i disagree There is certain things mentioned in the Bible. The prophets they did incest with the daughter. Now, how can I agree that Prophet Lut, alayhi salam, Prophet Lot did incest with his daughter? I can't agree with that. What I say, this portion cannot be the word of God. It is adulteration. It is a corruption. It's a fabrication. Therefore, I'm saying that if you read the Bible, there's something like the red letter Bible. This is a red letter Bible. Red letter means. all the words that jesus christ peace be upon him he spoke i and read and if you compile them it will hardly be two columns of the newspaper very little a small percentage what i am trying to tell that at least let us agree to follow what is common that doesn't mean i agree everything of the bible because the today's bible is not maintained in the original form why because all the previous scriptures as i mentioned in my talk 
was supposed to be meant for those people and for that time. Today, you have to follow the last and final message that is the glorious Quran and the last and final message the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Irrespective whether they are born in India or Pakistan or America or UK or UAE or Saudi Arabia, you have to follow the last and final revelation the Quran and the last and final message the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. You tell me to take the good points, I have taken the good points of Christianity. As far as Islam is concerned, I don't know a single bad point. You point out to me and I will give you the reply. I challenge anyone to point out a single verse of the Quran which is against humanity. Don't point out the Muslims. I'm not here to support the Muslims. I'm here talking about Islam. <laughs> to understand Islam, don't look at the Muslims. Look at the Quran and the authentic Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet. And I challenge anyone to point out a single statement in the Quran or the Hadith which is against humanity. There may be certain statements you may feel is wrong because of lack of knowledge, not having the status of the world. But inshallah, if you think anything is wrong, you're most welcome to point out. And I will try and explain to you why this is there in Islam, the reason and the hikmah behind it. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, sir. The dialogue and cross questions continue. The next brother on the mic. Asalaamu Alaikum, Dr. Naik. My name is Snobi and I'm an engineer by profession. In the Bible, chapter Isaiah chapter 53, it talks about a suffering servant. A servant who is suffering, who is oppressed, bruised, and who dies, who gives his life for sin of the people, of mankind. Could you please clarify, who is the servant of God? Thank you. The brother has quoted a verse from the book of Isaiah saying that the messenger is going to come, who is going to die for the suffering, etc., for the others. And there are many Christians who try and assume that this is the prophecy of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. I'm just telling you, assume. Now, brother, you should note that the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 18, verse number 20, it says, the soul that in it shall die which people normally quote, the soul that sin shall die. But the missionaries, they put a full stop where there's no full stop. The complete verse is, the soul that in it shall die. The father shall not bear the iniquity of the son, neither shall the son bear the iniquity of the father. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked turns and comes to the straight path, he shall not die. One thing, that sin cannot be inherited. So the concept of the church, of the original sin, the original sin, what the church says, that Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, they ate the forbidden fruit, and that is the reason humankind is born in sin. That is the reason Almighty God sent His beloved Son, begotten Son, Jesus Christ, peace be upon Him, quoting Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse number 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in Him shall not die but have everlasting life. I am just trying to put a nutshell. This is what you all believe. Now, coming to the question, of the original sin. The concept of original sin is nowhere to be found in the Bible. It is the teaching of the church. According to the Ezekiel chapter 18 verse number 20, it says, the soul that sin shall die. The father shall not bear the iniquity of the son, neither shall the son bear the iniquity of the father. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. But if the wicked turns and comes to the straight path, he shall not die. So based on this Ezekiel chapter 18 verse number 20, it completely negates the original sin that is propagated by the church. The Quran too says, no bearer of burden can bear the burdens of the others. No bearer of burden. So surely sin is not inherited. Eve tempted Adam to eat the forbidden fruit. Adam ate the forbidden fruit. May peace be upon them. Did Adam peace be upon him ask me before eating the fruit? Did he ask me? No. So why should I be responsible? If he had asked me and if I told him yes, then you can catch my collar. Now, Adam didn't ask me before eating the forbidden food, peace be upon him. So why should I be held responsible? How can God be so unjust? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 40, Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is never unjust in the least degree. So sin is not inherited. So your concept of saying that this refers to Jesus Christ is totally wrong. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, that is the concept of teaching of the church, that for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. See, son, if you analyze in the Bible, Almighty God has got sons by the tons. It says, Abraham was the son of God. Ephraim was son of God. Isaiah was son of God. As many people 
and they are led by the Spirit of God, are sons of God. So Bible has got sons by the tongue. But the Christians say that no, no, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, not a normal son, he is the begotten son. Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him shall not die but have everlasting life. Now here if you analyze this word begotten son, according to the scholars of Christianity, if you refer to the Revised Standard Version, revised by Thaidu's Christian scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 different corporate denominations, these Christian scholars say that this word begotten is interpolation, is a fabrication, is a concoction, and they threw it out of the Bible. So if you read the Revised Standard Version, this word begotten is not there. So we verily believe, if son means a righteous person, then Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, surely was the son of God. He was a righteous person, but he was not the begotten son. And this concept of inheriting sin is nowhere to be found in the Bible. It's the teaching of the church. In fact, Bible negates this concept. So surely what you're trying to indicate to me that this prophecy of Isaiah, it doesn't... Yes, messengers have come. Most of the messengers, they suffered. Whether it be Moses, peace be upon him. Whether it be Jesus, peace be upon him. Whether it be Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. All the messengers, they suffered. And the hadith of the Prophet, that the maximum that were put to test among the human beings are the messengers of Allah. More difficult the test, the higher will be the reward. So all the messengers of God suffered. But to say that they suffered and they had the sin of all the humankind is nowhere to be found in the Bible. It is the teaching of the church and it's against the Bible as well as the Quran. Hope that answers the question, brother. Yes, sister. Eliana, non-Muslim, by qualification teacher. Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. I have one question. I find it immoral and vulgar for a Muslim to have more than one wife. What do you think about this? Uh, actually, I know the roots of this, but I want to know your opinion about this. And I think if uh, our religions, Christianity and Islam unites, I think that Muslims should have one wife. <laughs> Sisters asked a very good question, very common question, very important question. She asked that she thinks, according to her, it is immoral for a Muslim to have more than one wife. And she's requesting me that if Christians and Muslims unite on this point, it will be very good. That's what I want to do. But we unite on what is the truth, not what is falsehood. Quran, sister, is the only religious scripture on the face of the earth, which says marry only one. There's no scripture on the face of the earth. You read the Bible, you read the Ramayana, you read the Mahabharata, you read the Veda. No scripture except the Quran says marry only one. If you read the Hindu scriptures, if you read the Hindu scriptures, Ramayan, the father of Sri Ram, King Dashrath, he had more than one wife. If you read Mahabharat, Sri Krishna, how many wives he had? Four, ten, thousand. He had 16,108 wives. <laughs> if you read the Bible, if you read the Bible, Solomon had 700 wives. According to the Bible, Abraham had three wives. So according to the Bible, according to Judaism and Christianity, a man can have as many wives as he pleases. Four, five, ten, thousand, no upper limit. Islam has put an upper limit. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number three, marry woman of your choice in twos, threes or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. So according to Hinduism, <laughs> according to Christianity, you can marry as many wives as you wish. One, five, ten, twenty, thousand, ten thousand, no upper limit. Islam says, marry one of a choice in twos, threes or fours, but if you can't do justice, marry only one. So Islam says, you can marry more than one, only if you can do justice, otherwise you can't. And even if you can do justice, maximum four. Now let's analyze what Quran says. Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 129, it is difficult to be just between your wives, therefore do not turn away from them altogether. So many people have a misconception that in Islam, it is compulsory to have four wives. It's not compulsory to marry more than one wife, sister is optional, it's mubah. But if you marry more than one wife, and if you can't do justice, then you have a problem. Now let us understand what are the logical reasons, sister. I'll give the logical reasons, and then if you want, you can counter question. The logical reason why Islam gives permission for some people to have more than one wife. Now by nature, if you analyze, male and female are born in equal proportion. But you ask any pediatrician, any medical doctor of the children, he will tell you that the female child can fight the germs and the diseases much better than the male child. So there are more male children dying 
as compared to female children. As life goes on, there is death due to cigarette smoking, death due to various other diseases, death due to alcoholism, death due to war, death due to accidents. There are more males dying as compared to female. Today in the world system, if you analyze, there are more females in the world as compared to males. There are more women as compared to men. Except in a few third world countries like India, where I come from, the female population is less than the male population. It is because of female feticide and female infanticide. If you stop this evil practice of female feticide and female infanticide, even in India, the population of the females will outnumber the male population. Today, according to statistics, in New York alone, there are more than 1 million females more than males. In USA alone, there are 7.8 million females more than males. In Germany alone, there are 5 million females more than males. In UK alone, there are 4 million females more than males. In Russia alone, there are 9 million females more than males. And God alone knows how many millions of females are more than males throughout the world. Suppose I agree with you hypothetically that one man should marry only one woman. And if my sister happens to live in America, and if the market is saturated, or if your sister happens to live in America, and if the market is saturated, every man has found a woman for himself. Yet, there will be 7.8 million females who will not find life partners. The only option remaining for these 7.8 million females is that they either marry a man who already has a wife or become public property. People will say, public property? Zakir, such a harsh word. It is the most sophisticated word I can use. I can't use a better word than that. You either marry a man who already has a wife or become public property. There's no third option. So now if you analyze in USA, according to American statistics, a common American on average has eight different sexual partners before he settles down with one. That means some may have two, some may have 10, some may have 20. Eight different sexual partners before he settles down with one. And you can have as many mistresses as you want. 1, 10, 20, no problem. But legal wife more than one, it doesn't go down the throat. And you ask any modest woman, if a woman becomes the second legal wife of a man, she gets respect, she gets honor, she gets her rights. If you become a mistress, there's no honor, there are no rights, she's degraded. So Islam has the solution to the problems of humankind. Today, there are more women in the world than the men. According to me, Islam has permitted some men to have more than one wife so that the woman can live modestly. Otherwise, it's not possible. I do agree with you, sister. I do agree with you, sister, that a woman would not like to share a husband. I agree with you. That a woman would not like to share a husband, but no woman under normal circumstances would like a husband to marry one more woman. But the Islamic Sharia says, let a small loss take place to prevent a big loss. A good Muslim ma, a good Muslim woman who knows the world scenario, she would not mind taking a small loss that is sharing a husband to prevent a big loss that is making a sister becoming a public property. <laughs> yes, sister. You have any? I said immoral because if a woman has more than one man, she is a bad woman. But if a man has more than one woman, he is okay. it's okay. Yeah. That's a very good question. Sisters ask the question that if a man has more than one woman, he's a good man. No. If a man has more than one wife, no problem. But if he has more than one woman, even he's a bad man. Like in America, one man has got four mistress, five mistress, ten mistress, even in India, he's a bad man. But if he has a legal wife, if he does nikah, if he marries her, gives her due rights, gives her mayor, equal time, equal justice, then he's a good man. But now the counter question, why can't a woman have more than one husband, correct? Is that your question? Uh, Is your question that why can't no, a woman I, have more I than one husband? I was thinking that in case if female population increases and male population decreases, so female can have two or three husbands. That's a very good question. You have a hypothetical question. But Almighty God, who's our creator, he knows better than you and me. He's our creator. And the reason, because God has made the woman a stronger sex. She is medically more stronger than the man. You know that? I am a medical doctor, sister. Medically, a woman can live for longer years than a man. We think the man is strong. Physically, man is strong. But medically, the woman is stronger. She lives longer. Her longevity, the average span of a woman is few years more than a man. There are less deaths in the pediatric age group. And regarding your main question, 
that Islam allows polygyny, a man to have more than one wife, but does not allow polyandry, that is a woman to have more than one husband. Why? The reason is that if a man has more than one wife and if a child is born, you can easily identify who is the father and who is the mother. But if a woman has more than one husband and if the child is born, you can identify the mother but you can't identify the father. So if you go to admit your child in the school, what is the name of the father? You may have to give two names. <laughs> now we know that medical science is advanced by DNA genetic coding. We can come to know who the father is, but that is now, not in the past. Islam is there since time immemorial. And this is not the only reason. Furthermore, there are various other reasons. Man is biologically more sexual as compared to the woman. Thirdly, a man can do the role of a multiple husband as compared to women doing a role of multiple wives. Because she undergoes menstrual cycle, there are various psychological changes which it will be difficult for her to do the role of multiple wives. And furthermore, today science tells us that if a man has more than one sexual partner and if they're loyal to them, like if a man has more than one wife, more than one sexual partner, and if all of them are faithful to each other, the man does not Neither the woman develop any sexual transmitted disease. But if a woman has more than one sexual partner, if she has more than one husband, then the sexually transmitted disease will emerge. She will have that disease and she'll retransmit it back to the husband. So even medically, it is not good for a woman to have more than one sexual partner. Hope that answers the question. Any question? Good evening, Dr. Zakir. And uh, my name is Beryl D'Souza. I'm from Bombay. Uh, tonight, I must thank you for the wonderful lecture. And I must tell you that uh, I used to see you on the television and follow your lectures ever since, yeah, since the past some years when I was in college. I, tonight, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, first of all, I would like to tell you two things. You said two things. One was like associating anything with God is a sin. It's the biggest sin, rather. The second thing you said that the form of prayer is that the Muslims follow is that you put your forehead down and it humbles yourself. Now, myself being from Bombay, I would, uh, because this is something I've noticed there, I, and I would also like to know clearly what is the concept about the dargahs that people go to and the uh, people follow. The sister asked a very good question. They are asking a question regarding the Muslims now. <laughs> and it's a very intelligent question. She says that in Islam, if associating partners with God is the biggest sin and the best form of worship is to prostrate, then what happens in dargahs? People go to dargah and they prostrate. So is it right or is it wrong is the basic question. Sister, I do agree with you. You have understood my lecture very clearly and very correctly that associating partners with God. Anyone does, it is wrong. Whether he calls himself a Muslim or non-Muslim. Whether he calls himself John, Abdullah, Zakir, Muhammad. Anyone who associates partners with God, he is doing the biggest sin. And we can prostrate to no one but to Almighty God. So anyone who prostrates to anyone besides Almighty God, he is doing shirk. He is associating partners with God. So if any human being goes to any grave, and he prostrates to that grave and he worships that grave, he is doing the biggest sin, irrespective whether he calls himself a Muslim or non-Muslim. Does the sister have a connected question? So, um, okay, if you would give me the opportunity, I would further like to ask you. So, um, basically I've seen, like you said, anybody, okay, be it a Muslim or Christian or Hindu, whoever does that. Now, if I tell you, I, uh, from what I have seen and known is like a huge percentage, okay, they are the, uh, the people, uh, I could call them the Muslims, they go to the Targas, then what, what do you have to say about it? So as far as the Arabic word Muslim is concerned, a true Muslim is a person who submits his will to God. A true Muslim will never bow down to any grave. I am aware, sister. I wouldn't say that you're wrong, you're right, that there is quite a large quantity of so-called Muslims who bow down to these graves. What do I have to say? I feel they are doing wrong, they are doing shirk, they have to change. And that's what in my talks I even tell them, 
that if you want to go to a grave, the Prophet said that you can go to a grave, it reminds you of your Akhira, that one day you have to die. So when you go to a grave, you can pray for the person, but you can't pray to him. You can pray for him. That may Allah give him Janate Firdaus, may he forgive his sins, etc. But you can't pray to him. Prayers should only be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iya kanabdu wa kanastain. They alone we worship, they alone we ask for help. So my talks I even targeted to these Muslims and I tell them also that I have given other talks that you should not worship, you should not prostrate to graves. This is wrong, it's a big sin. And Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, since you are from Bombay, I am also from Bombay, there are thousands of youngsters, mashallah, after my talk, who have stopped worshipping graves. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Uh, my name is Lee, I'm a student. My question is that earlier you mentioned that Jesus is also a Muslim because he submits to the will of God. Um, and this is regardless of the fact that he drank alcohol, he didn't pray five times a day. You know, he did, he, all he, the only action he did was submit to the will of God. So, given that, that thinking, that logic, wouldn't that mean that any person of the book, Christian or Jew, is in fact a Muslim, as long as they agree to mis submit to the will of God? Whether if I understood your question correctly, you said any person, whether Christian or Jew, etc., who submits the will to God, is a Muslim. Yeah, as you said about, about Jesus, you said Jesus is a Muslim right. for that reason. But whether, I do agree with you, anyone who submits the will to God in Arabic, you call him a Muslim. But, you should first know what has God commanded us. If you think something else, if you read a scripture which is not the word of God, and start thinking or submitting a will to God by following a scripture which is not the word of God, then you are not a true Muslim. So first you have to identify what has God commanded us. And if you do a comparative study of all the scriptures of the various world religions, you will find out if you use the test of science, logic, etc. The only scripture that passes the test is the last and final testament. If there's something like Old Testament and New Testament, the Quran is the last testament. So, if you want to truly submit a will to God, first you have to find out who is this true God, what has He commanded us, and after that you have to submit your will. So therefore, when I say a true Muslim is a person who follows the commandments of Almighty God. Now Jesus Christ, peace be upon Him, was a messenger of God. He directly got revelation from God. So surely he followed the will of Almighty God. So today also, if a Christian, supposedly, what the talk is based on, that at least let us agree to follow what is common in your scripture and my scripture. Suppose you will say Bible is the word of God, I am saying Quran is the word of God. So let us agree to follow what is common. What is different, keep it aside. So your Bible says believe in one God. So if you believe in Trinity, you are going against the Bible. The word Trinity does not exist in the Bible. But it's then the Quran. Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, 171, Wala taqulu salasa. Don't say trinity. So if you believe in trinity, you're going against the Bible. For the Bible says that, that you should not do idol worship. Bible says you have to believe in the last and final messenger. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, verse number 12 to 14, I have many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now, for he when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that the year shall he speak. He shall show you things to come. He shall glorify me. So if you are a true follower of the Bible, you have to follow in the last and final message. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. That means you have to follow the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet. So if you follow the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet, you become a Muslim. So my talk is based on, let us agree to follow what is common. Differences, as I told earlier, I can give a talk on hundreds of contradictions in the Bible, which I don't intend doing. There was a person who wrote a book in USA, Dr. William Campbell, that there are 30 scientific reasons in the Quran. I went to Chicago, I had a debate, and I clarified all his misconceptions. And when I pointed out 38 scientific errors in the Bible, he could not reply to any. So I cannot attribute these errors to Almighty God. So first I have to identify which is the book of God and then follow it. So even if you agree for sake of argument that Bible is the word of God, even then you have to follow the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So let us agree what is common in both the scriptures and let us agree at least implement on that today and come to common terms. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Good evening, uh, doctor. My name is Daniel. I'm a student. Uh, the 54th verse of the 7th chapter of the Quran says that Allah created the earth, the heavens and the earth in six days. 
and the 42nd chapter, verses 9 to 12, clearly state that Allah created earth and heaven as it is today in eight days. What is your reply to that? The brother asked a question asked by Christian missionaries against the Quran. And there are several places in the Quran where it says Allah has created the heavens and the earth in six days. What the brother is referring, chapter number 41, verse number 9 to 12. He is saying that the Quran says that the heavens and the earth was created in eight days. The word eight is not there in the Quran. What it says, I'll tell you. The Quran says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has created the heavens and the earth. And all those who differ, there are people who are bound to differ, are the ones who do shirk. And the verse continues, Almighty God created the earth in two days and Almighty God created the sustenance on the earth, the mountains, everything else in four days. And verse number 11 of chapter number 41, Summa, most of the translations say after, it means various other things. Then Almighty God created the heavens in two days. Now, normally a person reads 2 plus 4 plus 2 is equal to 8. But the word 8 is not there. God Almighty created the heavens in two days. Now, if we know Quran, we'll be able to reply. If a person does superficial leading, he may get misled. And Quran says, those people who try to mislead the people with this verse are those who associate partners with God. So Almighty God knows that people will use these verses of the Quran to mislead the people. The reply to the query. The reply is that Almighty God created the earth in two days. They created the sustenance, the trees, the mountains, and in due proportion in four days. Summa. Summa in Arabic can also mean simultaneously. It doesn't have to mean after. It can mean that, it can mean simultaneously Almighty God created the heavens in two days. For example, if I tell you, I'm going to construct a building 30 stories high in six months. That's my statement. If you go into details, I'll tell that I will be creating the basement, the foundation of the building in two months and the structure in four months, all the 30 stories. Simultaneously, when I'm creating the foundation, I will even create the compound wall in two months. So basically, while I'm creating the foundation, I'm even creating the compound wall. That doesn't mean it is two plus four plus two, eight months. It is while I'm creating the foundation, simultaneously, I'm even creating the compound wall. So actually, my building will be constructed in six months, not eight months. So similarly, when Allah says, when He created the earth, he even created the heavens. So the two days of the earth, simultaneously Allah created the heaven. That is in Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. Avalam yaral lazina kafuru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. That the heaven and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. So Quran says we created the heaven and the earth simultaneously. Fafatakna We clove them asunder. This is Nothing but the Big Bang in a nutshell. Today, Big Bang tells us that the whole universe was one primary nebula. Later on, there was secondary separation, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the planets, the earth on which we live. So, based on Big Bang, science even doesn't disagree with the Quran. That when the heaven was being created, the earth was being created simultaneously. So, the first two days and the last two days are simultaneously. So, there's no contradiction. It's a contradistinction. Contradistinction means giving other facets of the thing. It is not contradiction. Contradiction means two things with the opposite. Contradistinction means telling you other qualities. For example, if I say that you are very honest, tomorrow I tell you are very kind. It's not contradiction. It's a contradistinction. You are honest also and you are kind also. But tomorrow if I say that dishonest, then there's a contradiction. So this verse of the Quran gives more details how the six days were divided. First two days the earth, simultaneously the heavens and later on four days the things on the earth were made the mountains the trees in due proportion hope that answers the question yes brother my name is Mahesh uh, me Mumbai I I have been attending your uh, talks in Dubai and other places for the last six years 
today's it was a scintillating and fantastic talk by you. I've been uh, reading Islam in focus in Khalid times and I have read the Holy Quran in Saudi Arabia. Could you please elucidate on what is Taqwa and about Surah Al-Fatiha? Brother, mashallah, Brother Mahesh is from Bombay, the same town where I come from. He's been hearing my lecture for the past six years and the other sister also, mashallah, she's been hearing my talk for a few years. And he's asked the question that what is Taqwa? Taqwa means piety. It means God consciousness. It means righteousness. There's a hadith, someone asked, what is taqwa? It is like when you're going in a forest which has got thorns, etc. And you're afraid that your garment may get stuck in the thorns. So how carefully you pick up your garment and walk through these plants and trees of thorns, that is taqwa. So basically it is God consciousness. It is piety. It is righteousness. So this is what is taqwa in short. And I would like to invite you that since you have been watching and hearing my talks since the past six years and the other sisters past few years, we live in the same city, Bombay, I would like to welcome you to the fold of the Deen al-Haq, the religion of truth. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you hidayah. And inshallah, inshallah, <laughs> that inshallah, I pray to Allah to give you hidayah and inshallah, you also have the true taqwa. That's the God consciousness and piety. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. When you quote the Bible, you take a very literary or literal sense of what the teachings of the Bible are. And um, I, for the past 500 years, we've taken it more as parables and stories that you know, it shouldn't be taken literally, but for the actual meanings behind it. And then my question is, is there anything like a movement in that in Islam where instead of taking a literal sense, it's just taking the morals behind what the Quran has to say? Brother, that's the question that I have quoted the Bible and I take everything literally, but since the past few hundred years, there are parables. There are even parables in the Quran. There are parables in the Quran. But if the Quran says something literally, many a times you can understand that one word may have various meanings. If a word has got five, six meanings, either all the five, six meanings are correct or maybe you have to take one meaning only. But that does not mean the Quran says something else and you take the opposite meaning. There are parables in the Quran also. Many parables in the Quran. But that doesn't mean it literally goes against the Quran. So what the Quran says and the Bible says, if the original Injil, the revelation which was given to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it was sent as a guidance. So what is mentioned, you have to follow it. Yes, there may be certain times that there may be other meanings which may also be right. But that does not mean what is the normal meaning that should not be taken. Yes, brother. Like, for example, um, you were quoting uh, Leviticus about the, like, the clothing for, in Christianity. Um, but in the later teachings, uh, Jesus talks about just being modest and be modest for yourself. And so that a Christian would take not the literal meaning of you need to cover up you need to not have the loose clothing, but just say that in modern society, it's a different idea that modesty isn't the same. Very good. See, I like, I really like your question. If you ask me a question, and I'll clarify you, I'll try my level best. The brother has given an example that when I talk about Leviticus, I didn't quote Leviticus, I quoted Deuteronomy chapter number 22, verse number 5, etc., which talks about modesty, 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 9, even 1 Corinthians, Chapter number 11, verse 5 to 7, modesty. What now, Brother Simon tell me that what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, told that you have to be modest. But what he meant was not literally about the clothes, but just modest in society. That is your understanding of the Bible. Let's see what Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 70 to 20, think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Until the heaven and the earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall pass away from the law until all be fulfilled. And whosoever shall break one of the least commandments and teach men should do so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall keep the commandments and teach the same, shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven. This is a verbatim quotation from King James Version. I'm speaking from my head. 
It's a verbatim quotation from King James Version, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20. So Jesus Christ says that even if you break one jot or tittle from the law, from the Old Testament, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So when the Old Testament says, the woman shall not wear clothes that which pertinent to a man, and a man shall not wear clothes that which pertinent to a woman. Now tell me, brother Zakir, that's a literal sense. Now the society is changing. So Jesus Christ said, peace be upon him, if you break one law, jot or tittle, you shall not enter Jannah. Now do you mean to say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came to misguide us? Not at all. He clearly said, that until the heaven and the earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall pass away until all be fulfilled. Did later on in the teaching of Paul, St. Paul, who is the self-appointed apostle of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he tells us that, see, the law is nailed to the cross. That is his teaching. It's not the teaching of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Who do you believe? In Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, or St. Paul? So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, unless you are better than the Jews, you shall not enter Jannah. That means everything what is mentioned in the Old Testament, not to have pork, you have to be modest, has to be followed. That's the reason if you go, the nuns, the nuns, they are dressed up like the Muslima. Have you seen the photograph of Mother Mary? She is completely covered. Her head is covered. Up to the wrist, up to the ankle. I am sure in future you may have, God knows, Mother Mary may be wearing skirts. That is a later development. But the true photographs, if you analyze, same thing with the nuns. The nuns are properly covered. Why? So in Islam, every Muslim is a nun. Every Muslim, in terms of piety, she has to be passed, she has to be modest. So what I'm telling that if Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then we Muslims are more Christian than the Christian themselves. Yes, brother. Well, how the question um, was supposed to be about how uh, modern societies interprets these modern these religions and incorporates them into our, you know, society. So if we're interpreting them not as a literal sense, we're going to listen like the scripture you quoted. It, it would just say. It would be how you feel that Jesus meant by that saying, which would be that we should follow the teachings of the Old Testament, and maybe not literally, and we should think about what he means by the laws of what to wear. So when he says, follow all this or you can't go to heaven, it, we, modern person after the Reformation would think would be that it's what it, he interprets Whether it as. if I agree with you that in every modern age we try and read the then what is the use of the Bible? What is the use of the Quran? If you're going to reinterpret, keep on reinterpreting into modern age and what the modern society believes, you're going to put the Bible into that shell. So what is the use of the Bible then? Why do you require the Bible? Why do you require it? What you can say that if science and technology advance, you can understand the Bible better, understand the Quran better, I've got no objection. But if you tell me, depending how the modern society behaves, you have to reinterpret the Quran or the Bible, it is totally nonsense. God is our creator. He knows what is best for us. Do you mean to say that God did not know? You are limiting God. That means you are trying to tell me that God did not know that the society is going to change. If you analyze the Quran, though it was revealed 1400 years ago, you cannot point out a single verse of the Quran which is against modern established science. Do you know that? However much the science has established, however much the science advances, it will never be able to prove even a single verse wrong. Yes, it will be able to give a new dimension. When science advances, maybe we will be able to understand that aspect of Quran better. Today, with our limited knowledge of science, we may not be able to understand certain verses of the Quran. But that does not mean you are giving a new look depending upon how the modern society is developing. Modern society, however much it develops, the law will be the same. The woman should be in hijab. The man should lower his gaze. It's not like Canada. Now a man can marry a man. In Islam, we don't believe in majority. We believe in truth. Truth prevails. Haq prevails. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Seek ye the truth, and the truth shall free you. We don't believe in democracy that today you say, Okay, fine, gay marriages are fine. And today you say that modesty, fine, a woman can wear less clothes. See, that is the man-made law. The person who has created us the Almighty God. He knows what is good and what is bad for us. Therefore, religion means a way of life. So we follow the guidance given by a creator, then only we'll be on the true path. Hope that answers the question.
Yes, sister. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Aisha. I'm from Philippines. I born Christian. Now, I am just a Muslim one year. I have two... <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I would like to point out two things actually. The first thing is, I observe that most of us Muslims, they, uh, they strike or we speak about the weaknesses of other religions. Why don't we show the good things as the models against them? Like what I've heard in this session that we are more better than Christians. I am right now studying in Islamic Center and according to our some teachers, they said that no one in the world can judge a person. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can say that his heart is good, he is good. No one can judge in the world. What do you think about it? Sister has a question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can judge the hearts and I do agree with you. She is saying that why do we say that we are better? We should present what is good. Sister, what I did in this talk is I picked up the good things of Christianity. I am trying to tell the Christians that actually if you follow the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, it is good. I am trying to uplift them. I am not trying to degrade them. You have misunderstood my talk. What I am trying to say when I made the statement that if Christian means a person who follows the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, then we are more Christian than the Christian themselves. Trying to tell verse of the Quran, Come to common terms as I send you. I never said that we are better. We are following your Bible better. I am saying, I am telling them that why don't you follow your Bible also? At least follow what is common. I am trying to pick up the good points of the Bible. That if your Bible says that be modest, the woman should cover the head, that the woman should wear the veil, the woman should be modest. I am telling them, why aren't you modest? Where am I trying to prove that we are better than them? I am trying to say that at least let us agree to follow what is common. Again, this is not my technique. It is what our Creator Allah has told us. It is not my style. Allah is telling me to do this. If you say it is wrong, then you are telling Allah is wrong. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 64, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa imbarinamainakum. Come to common terms as bin us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'abada illallah. That we worship none but Allah. So we have to convey the message to the non-Muslims that come to common terms and the best term is that worship only one God. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Uh, good evening, doctor. I'm Rob from Philippines. I just want to know, I just want to be clarified about the role of Ismail, the son of Abraham in Islam. Well, the question that what is the role of Ismail, may peace be upon him, in Islam. We believe that Ismail, peace be upon him, was the son of Abraham. He's not only mentioned the Quran, he's even mentioned the Bible. The Bible and the Quran, it does mention that Abraham, peace be upon him, he had two wives, Sarah and Hajra. And even in the Bible, it's mentioned that the wife, same thing in the Quran. So Isaac, peace be upon him, Ishaq, is the son of Sarah, peace be upon her. And Ishmael is the son born from Hajra, peace be upon her. So both of them were sons of Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, and both are prophets of God. We have to respect and love both of them. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum. My question is kind of related to the one uh, the sister started asking and the, the other one who uh, commented on uh, picking good things in religions. See, uh, I believe, I believe uh, Islam is part of this continuous chain of religions. Like if we're talking about Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, in order to be a Muslim, you have to believe first in Judaism and Christianity. My question is, like the Samaritans and the crucifixion of the Christ, like, uh, I mean, let me say the, the Islamic story about the crucifixion of the Christ, in other words, and uh, I believe that it's, you know, 
once this issue is clarified, we'll have no more major differences. Like, gaps will just turn off. The brother has a question. He has posed two parts of the question. That a Muslim can only be a Muslim first if he believes in Judaism and Christianity and then Islam. Which I disagree, brother. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, Inna dina in the la al-Islam. The only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. So what Moses, peace be upon him, preached was nothing but Islam. He never preached Judaism. What Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, preached was nothing but Islam. He never preached Christianity. The word Christianity doesn't exist in the Bible. Do you know that? The word Christianity doesn't exist in the Bible. The first time the word Christian is used in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts it says that the people of Antioch, they called the followers of Jesus Christ as Christians. It was a nickname given by the people of Antioch. Jesus Christ, peace be upon never heard the word Christian in his life. Do you know that? So where did he teach Christianity? So for you to say a Muslim should first follow Judaism, Christianity, then Islam is totally wrong. In Nadina in the Lai Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. What all the messengers preached is nothing but Islam. These, what you find, the Bible and the other books, they are the corrupted form of the original revelations. Now coming to your question. That what is the Islamic version of crucifixion? What is Islam actually about crucifixion? Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 157, that they said in boast that we kill Jesus, the son of Mary, the Jews, they said in boast, we kill Jesus, son of Mary. They killed him not, neither did they crucify him. Walakin should be alone. It was only made to appear so. And all those who differ are full of doubts. Illa with only conjecture to follow. yakina. For a surety, they killed him not. So according to the Quran, the Jews said in boast that we killed Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. But they killed him not, neither did they crucify him. It was only made to appear so. And all those who differ are full of doubts with only conjectures to follow. For a surety they killed him not. So according to the Quran, we believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was not crucified. It was only made to appear so. And I've had a debate on was Christ really crucified. Crucifixion means a person should die on the cross. And in my debate, I've proved that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he did not die on the cross. So we don't have an English term for a person who's put on the cross, but does not die. So the new word that we can coin is crucifixion. F-I-C-T-I-O-N, fiction, not fiction, not F-I-X-I-O-N. So what we believe, that it was a crucifixion. C-R-U-C-I-F-I-C-T-I-O-N, but it was not crucifixion, F-I-X-I-O-N. Because I proved in my talk that he did not die on the cross. To cut it short, to make the Christian realize, in one nutshell, how to prove that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not die on the cross. He was not crucified. When Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was asked by the people that, oh master, show us some signs. So he replies in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 38, he says, you evil and adulterous generation, you ask me for a sign, no sign shall be given except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, anyone who is a Christian, he knows the sign of Jonah, he has to go to the book of Jonah. It is only one page, only two sides. And when you ask any Christian about the sign of Jonah, they will tell us that Jonah was asked by Almighty God to go to Nineveh to deliver the message, but he runs away from the commandment and goes to Joppa. So here, while he's traveling in the ship, there's a storm. So it was a thinking at that time that the storm is due to a person has not obeyed to the commandment of his Lord. So they draw lots. So Jonah, peace be upon him, he volunteers and says, I have run away from the commandment. At that time, it was a thinking that if they throw the person overboard in the sea, the sea would become calm. So they take Jonah and they throw him overboard. Now when they throw Jonah overboard, was he dead or alive? Was he dead or alive? He was alive. When he goes in the sea, normally in a raging sea, in a storm, a human being ought to die. But Jonah does not die. Peace be upon him. He's alive. A fish comes and gobbles him up. When the fish gobbles him up, was Jonah dead or alive? He was alive. If he dies, 
it's not a miracle. He's alive, it's a miracle. Three days and three nights, the fish takes him around the ocean. The man ought to die because of suffocation. He does not die, it's a miracle. The fish vomits him out on the shore. He ought to die, he does not die. It's a miracle of a miracle of a miracle of a miracle. He's thrown overboard, he does not die. A fish comes and gobbles him up, he does not die. Three days and three nights, he roams in the belly of the fish, he does not die. He's vomited out, he does not die. A miracle of a miracle of a miracle. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now when you ask a Christian, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, in the sepulchre, in his grave, for three days and three nights, was he dead or alive? Was he dead or alive? The Christian tell us he was dead. But then there's a contradiction. For him to fulfill the prophecy of the sign of Jonah, he has to be alive. So only on this one prophecy, there are various ways I can prove he wasn't crucified. It proves that Jesus Christ, peace be upon, did not die on the cross. He was alive. So based on this, we can prove from the Bible that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he did not die on the cross. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, puts all his eggs in one basket. He says, no sign shall be given except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And further, if you analyze, even three days and three nights, it is not fulfilled. Because on Friday he's put on the cross. So before Saturday comes, he's put down. He's in the grave. When? When he's put in the grave. He's put on Friday night. He's there on Saturday full day, Saturday night, Sunday morning is out. So it's two nights and one day. So even the prophecy of three days and three nights is not fulfilled. But surely if he has to fulfill the other way, like Jonah, he has to be alive. And I've given various arguments from the Bible and proofs that Jesus Christ, peace be, was not crucified. You can take my videotape. I had a debate with an Arab Christian, an Iraqi Christian. Was Christ really crucified? And I proved there that he was not crucified, he was raised up alive. Hope that answers the question.